Normally on Tuesdays, we catch up with Coach Sanford, but he joins us on this Wednesday. Mike Sanford, longtime offensive coordinator at Notre Dame Ohio, uh, and uh, Boise State, most recently the interim head coach at Colorado, joins us here. And Coach, we, we haven't really hit on it because I don't know necessarily its impact on the gambling side of things, but I, I am curious. You've been around the game a long, long time. What is your take on everything that's coming out regarding the Michigan situation right now? Yeah, it's something that I've never been a part of. Um, I've been a part of knowing uh, that I'm calling plays and the other team knows our signs. Um, and, <laughs> it's got to be a great of, feeling, by the way. <laughs> it, it's literally the worst feeling that you could ever imagine as a play caller. Um, and so I've even gone as far as coming down on the sideline and being the signaler and like playing that kind of cat and mouse game, hiding behind offensive linemen, uh, you know, it, but that's like just with the standard operating procedure of everybody watching the all 22 film and then the coaches or the TV copy that coaches study. Um, and you know, like most, most coaches know that it's their responsibility and job to have a really thorough signal system. Um, and we went so far at Stanford um, we were a wristband operation and we carried almost 360 calls into a game plan. And I'm talking 360 individual lines on a wristband. And we were playing Arizona state led by Todd Graham. And we knew that they were a notorious signal stealing operation, but in the uh, ethical, but not really ethical, but legal kind of way. <laughs> and so we actually changed, we changed our call sheet and our wristbands. We had one printed for quarters, one, two, three, and four. We were all completely separate for the PAC 12 championship game. And so we like felt really good about, um, you know, we foolproofed our signal system and, uh, and our wristband system. And, you know, ironically, we just happened to win by about 30 points in that PAC 12 championship game. So uh, I think there was a little something to it. I think that Michigan is, um, everybody knows there's a lot of negativity surrounding this situation. It is serious. It is severe. Um, I worked for Jim Harbaugh at Stanford in 2007 and 2008. There was none of this kind of shenanigans going on. What it looks like to me um, is this stallions individual um, came up with this concept, was kind of doing it rogue on his own. But clearly, when you watch the sideline copy um, and the the angle looking at um, the Ohio State Michigan game from last season, uh, it was pretty intricate, and it it really did uh, lead to a, a full advantage for Michigan. So they will not have that advantage from here on out. That is very clear to say. And once again, this is a gambling show, it's a gambling network, but I'm just curious your opinion, a guy who has coached at the highest levels of division one football. And I, I didn't know this, but I heard, I think it was Danny Cannell mention it on a podcast, the bowl games, not the playoff, but the bowl games this year are going to allow comms into the helmet do you think that's where we're heading? And would, as an offensive play caller, would you like that to go the NFL style of being able to talk directly to your quarterback? Yes, it's it's asinine that we haven't gotten to that point to this yeah. to, in college football. I think I mean, you've got makes, enough I, money. I'm no, just going to go on a whim there and say I think there's enough money to be able to put put those into the helmets. Yeah, you can just see like the the salaries of conference commissioners and then the salaries <laughs> of the NCAA president. Like, come on, man. Like, um, we're we're creating issues that shouldn't be issues. This is something that should have been in play five, 10 years ago. I believe the NFL has been using it well over 10 years. Um, you know, the, the early concern about it was just the financial implication of, of doing it for group of five schools, mm -hmm. you know, and having been the head coach at a, at a Western Kentucky, trust me when I say it would have not have been in the budget or anywhere near that. So we would have had to get a handout from the NCAA. Um, and then I think there were some other issues with the NCAA war warranties of helmet. Um, that once the helmet goes in there or once that device goes into the helmet, that that warranty um, with Rydell was null and void. Come on. Like this is all ridiculous. It's one, one player on offense that wears it at a time and one player on defense at a time NCAA do the right thing um, and just make this part of college football going forward. And also, you know, look hard into what is going on in Michigan and do the right thing as well. And you got to uncover every stone in this situation because there is something going on in Ann Arbor. There's no doubt about that. Well, it seems like a really natural transition to do what I'm going to do and go from talking about Michigan to talk about James Madison because obviously <laughs> the two are very well connected. But, Mike, I want to ask you about this because last year we saw James Madison get in the top 25. First game, they go out and lose to Georgia Southern. Now they're back in the top 25 for the first time again and in a huge favorite role against Old Dominion. 
Can you kind of elaborate on what it feels like to get ranked and then kind of what comes along with that in your first game? Well, I would answer this way. When you're a program like James Madison, that's been at the top of whatever level they've asked you to compete in for the last decade plus. Um, I think that James Madison's in a place where they're just used to this territory, you know, and when you're playing the FCS playoffs, that's a, that's a ton of pressure that this, a lot of these seniors have gone through early in their careers. Um, just because every single game, you know, you win and you survive and you move on. So I don't think it's going to be an issue whatsoever. I think that they have built that program the correct way. They have depth, they have veteran players and, you know, they are to me, one of the great stories of college football and just leave it to the old NCAA <laughs> to ruin their opportunity to compete in a postseason bowl. Because frankly, right now it should be a two man race, in my opinion, between the Air Force Academy and James Madison for that group of five bowl game in the power five uh, in the New York six bowl games. I'm glad you mentioned Air Force. We're talking to Mike Sanford, who lives in the state of Colorado. Most recently was the interim head coach at Colorado. So you've probably heard and, and know a little bit about Air Force, obviously. Played them last year. When I was at CU. So, yeah, that, that, that didn't work out all so well. Uh, it, was, it was a bad day at the office there in uh, Falcon <laughs> State. <laughs> um, but uh, right, before we get to Air Force, because I may or may not have had a bet on Navy this past week, and I was under the assumption that their quarterback was going to be out for a while. Should we get to injury reports in college football? Was that a... A you know a, sh a you know a tactic of hey we we pulled one over Navy if you're Air Force or do you think that's a little dirty to say our quarterback's going to be out for a while and then he ultimately starts? Well, first off, Troy Calhoun's a head coach that I have a ton of respect for. He's and very winning good. Those, winning those Commander in Chief games are extremely difficult, and their offense takes a different um, it takes a different tone when Zach Larry is playing quarterback. You know, and I, I think that he was injured. He missed time in the Wyoming game. So it wasn't like he was making this up out of thin air. However, I do think that the safest bets right now relative to injury reports are what the Big Ten has, has advocated for and has made standard uh, procedure in the Big Ten conference, which I believe is, I think it's like six hours before game day or, or uh, game time before kickoff where you have to release your injury report. I think that should be commonplace around college football um, even if it is day of game, I think it's it's just a competitive advantage that you should eliminate. Um, I think the NFL is the ultimate level of football that everybody should aspire to play like, um, you know, whether it be eliminating signal stealing issues or whether it be playing the injury game. The funny thing about it, I, and you and I, Tim, texted over the weekend, there were a lot of military involved operations uh, in college football. And that was the, the theme of the weekend this past weekend between Air Force with the kind of the finessing of Zach Larrier is going to miss some time. Well, we I, clearly Zach Larrier just missed a couple periods of practice because he was out there <laughs> for the game. And, and, and Troy Calhoun didn't lie, you no. know, but once again, the NCAA has to step in and, and they have to take the serious stuff that's really happening in college football, the competitive advantages that are gained because of doing things in the gray. They've got to step in and make this game a level playing field. If not, what the frick is the NCAA even doing right now? <laughs> because they've completely waved the white flag of surrender as it relates to cheating and paying players and said, you know what? We're going to call it NIL now. Mike, I want to ask you about a game here. Georgia is a 14 and a half point favorite in the world's largest cocktail bowl or whatever they're supposed to call it now against Florida there in Jacksonville. And for Georgia, this will be the first game without Brock Bowers. And you've got a first-year starter in Carson Beck. And Bowers, of course, 41 catches, 567 receiving yards, both lead the team. Mike, as a coach and a play caller, what do you do here in this game for Georgia? Are you going to rely heavy on the run? Are you going to try and find the replacement? What's your plan of attack here? Well, if I'm Georgia, the film that I'm watching is I'm watching Utah do what they did against Florida in the opener, minus their starting quarterback, Cam Rising. Shorten the game, do what Georgia does, win in the trenches, run the football, allow Car Carson Beck to, to do what he's done effectively. I wasn't a fan four weeks ago on this very show. I think that he's turning into a very effective game manager with plus traits. Let him throw the ball down the field on your hard play action game that's established by your dominant ground game. Florida is one of those teams that's really hard to figure out. Uh, one week they look really good, and then the next week you don't even know what you're seeing. Um, I think that this Georgia team is still very thorough, top to bottom. 
Um, they're not in the business of signal stealing, apparently. Um, so I think that they're going to be on a really good course uh, to be able to play to their strengths, which is in their trenches, their running back position, and then use the play action game uh, to create explosive plays. We're talking to Mike Sanford, who a uh, longtime offensive coordinator, number of stats, including Utah State. So final minute with you, coach, on this. You went and saw Jordan Love, who you were as offensive coordinator at Utah State, uh, talk to the Packer fans out there because I do a radio show in Milwaukee. They're getting all worried about Jordan Love. What have you seen so far from Jordan Love and, and why should Packer fans still believe in him? Well, first off, I had a chance to go and, and actually uh, spent some time with Jordan the night before, brought my kids to the team hotel, spent some time with him and Aaron Jones. They're just awesome organization. Uh, I really believe Jordan's in a great headspace. You know, I was at that game with uh, former quarterbacks also at Utah State. Andrew Peasley is the starting quarterback at University of Wyoming was sitting with us. Um, and so it was a lot of fun to see him compete. I loved the come from behind um, opportunity to win the game. What I do think is both Packers fans and this franchise understand where they are right now. And they have an incredible amount of young talent. And they're paying those bills of developing youth right in front of our eyes. I think the Packers fan base understands that. Um, we're going to be going to Lambeau, myself, my family, to watch them play the Chargers. And I think that this team is going to continue to grow with young players, you know, like Christian Watson, Jordan Love, um, Luke Musgraves. There's a lot of young talent. It's fun to watch them come together, but it's going to be a long road. Mike, always Thank appreciate you. it. We'll talk to you next week. Great to be on, Tim. Appreciate you. There he is. Mike Sanford, longtime offensive coordinator in Division One football. Go to vsun.com slash subscribe to become a VEASAN Pro subscriber today.